John Wooden said, when, when opportunity comes, it's too late to prepare. And so you've got to like study and practice and learn. When I got out of college and started started in this real estate business of very different things, I drove my college car until I had like five rentals. When that market drops 10 or 20%, that's where yeah. there's going to be blood in the streets going by. Good morning, everybody. This is Yoshi Shiraki on K-Talk Radio, 1640 AM. And this is the show, Utah Home Sweet Home. Today, my special guest is a gentleman by the name of Justin Puchar, a friend of mine who is a very successful real estate individual. I call him individual, I should say professional, real estate professional, because he does a lot in real estate, not just a real estate agent or a flipper or a landlord or a property manager. He does a bunch of stuff, which we'll get into. But a little bit about Justin. He began his investing in 2004, where he bought his very first rental or very first home in Murray. Uh, at the time, he had no idea if he was going to move into it, rent it out, fix it up, change the counter, not change the counter, and he's come a very long way since then. Today, Justin has been in business for 17 years directly as a realtor with Keller Williams, an investor, a flipper, property manager, landlord, lender, and entrepreneur. He has represented banks selling their REO assets as well. He's also consulted with investors in their home markets in over 22 states and many of these things in between. <clears throat> All of these experiences have given Justin a great perspective and skills in making key decisions that create a full, t a full life for his family. He's also an avid cyclist, husband, and proud father of two, and loves and enjoys what he does every single day. Justin, thanks so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, you make me sound pretty good there. Did you write that yourself? I did. <laughs> Uh, all right, awesome. So, Justin, today I wanted to share with the audience the power of building a rental portfolio. Um, you know, rent uh, for for me. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't know the stock market, so I don't invest in the stock market. Right. But I know real estate, so I invest in real estate. So, for me, basically, what I like to think of is. Flipping kind of gives you the quick cash, and rentals give you the longevity of basically uh, wealth, right? Absolutely. And so, so basically, can you share a little bit with us uh, about building a rental portfolio, why you do it, and then I've got some questions that I wanted to run past you. Sure. So I think uh, maybe, maybe I should start off with a little bit of foundational stuff, because if we look at it realistically, we can't create a successful future if we really haven't studied the past. So the tech, internet, all these different things uh, provide it really e easy access for us to be able to, we don't have to recreate the wheel. We can duplicate, we can copy people uh, that you want to be like. So I would say <clears throat> a couple of key features I, I really read into is, is I, I really practice intentional living. <clears throat> you could call it maturity or vision or dreams or you know you've got a you've got a dream and, and, and it requires commitment start with a promise and end with commitment so uh, to give you a little bit of background when I got out of college and started started in this real estate business of very different things I drove my college car until I had like five rentals right nice. like I was aggressive people in my office were making fun of me and I was <laughs> like you know what it doesn't matter to me right yeah because I've got the future in mind. Awesome. So, uh, John Wooden said, "When when opportunity comes, it's too late to prepare." And uh, so you've got to like study and practice and learn. And so when that right opportunity comes across, you know you know how to identify I love that. and when to pull the trigger, right? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> so uh, let me give you an example, and this is something I really really live my life by, I guess, because I want to do the exact opposite. The Wall Street Journal came out, I want to say maybe like 10 years ago, they said the biggest money mistakes by decade by the average person, right? Yeah. So they said in the 20s, you're holding back investing, you're being really conservative, and you really have low financial literacy, right? Right. In your 30s, you got too much credit card debt, you're living too large, bigger vacations, the lavish spending. In your 40s, uh, you know, maybe you're spending too much on a house, the kids are costly, you're not working enough to, to set yourself up, right? Yeah. In your 50s, your standard of living is still pretty high. Uh, you're not saving enough or investing for retirement. And then the 60s, you 
most people probably draw Social Security too soon, right? Right. So these are mistakes. Interesting. So what I said early on was I'm going to do the exact opposite of what other people are doing. So smart. So in my 20s, I started buying heavily, right? I was mm -hmm. single. I didn't get married until I was 32. Nice. So I had some freedom, right? I yeah. Didn't, I didn't have somebody holding me back, per se, I guess, or right. kids or things like that. So uh, you got to be dis So when you say, hey, what are some important things to do in building a rental portfolio? You got to learn how to recognize opportunity, right? Yep. You've got to be disciplined, mm -hmm. very disciplined with your money, with your time, what you say yes to, uh, because it all inflicts how you do it. Uh, you got to do a lot of self education. Um, I would say, well, here's another thing. People always ask me, what's the market going? How's it going? Should I wait till next year, two years? Right. And I wish I could say, yeah, the market's going to go down because the investor in me says, hey, hold off. Because when that market drops 10 or 20%, that's where yeah. there's going to be blood in the streets going by, right? Right. <clears throat> but we can't wait. Exactly. Can't wait. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're always buying. Right. Yeah. So, so I look back to what I bought 16, 17 years ago, and I'm like, would I buy that again? And I, most of the time I say no. But in reality, time healed all those wounds. Like yep. The rental prices went up, values increased dramatically, double, yep. sometimes triple in value. So <clears throat> you just got to take action. Absolutely. <clears throat> I had a mentor once tell me, uh, he's like, no matter how good of a teacher I am, the best teacher you'll have is experience. So just start. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and it made so much sense because if you, like you said, some of those you wouldn't have bought, but you learned so much from just starting. Right, and, and we see this all the time at the RIA clubs or people we know, they analyze too much yes. and they forget to actually do something. It's like you achieve a certain amount of education or you start caring what everybody else is thinking and how your dad invested or yeah. how your trusted advisors, and it's not always the best way. you gotta, you got to make some risk, yeah. take some action, get something done. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Okay, so... Having said that, what would you say the top three things to consider when someone's starting to starting down the path of building a rental portfolio? Because obviously this rental portfolio for me isn't something that I live off of today. So maybe it's a little bit different from other people out there. They're living off their rentals. Uh, I'm using the rentals to leverage uh, purchasing more rentals, at which point they'll be my retirement one day. Um, Different reasons on why people build a rental portfolio, but whatever that reason is, what do you say is the top three things to consider when you're just getting started down that path? Well, I would say if you've got a day job, keep your day job, right? Yep. People are not thinking two, three, four years down the road. So financing is a, is a different game, right? You've got to legitimately qualify, so you've got to know what rules you can play within. Yep. And so a job or W-2 income or whatever it is, taxable wages, give you the freedom to make your own choices, right? Right. There's always seller financing, there's opportunities, there's private and hard money and all these different things. But the cheapest, most economical way that you can actually control an asset, which is control your destiny, right? Yep. Is you qualify on your own. Right. Get a good mortgage, you can get... You can qualify at four or low five percent for non-owner occupied property. That's amazing. <laughs> yes. When I started, it was like seven, seven and a half percent. Yes. I mean, and if you can still make that work, uh, you know, of course prices have gone up, but if you can make that work in a higher interest rate, you know, you can make just about anything work. So, so keep your day job, work awesome. your side hustle, right? Yep. <clears throat> As your side hustle grows and you're getting more income out of it. I'm the same as you, right? Yep. I'm not going to live off my rental income today. Right. Not for the next 15 years, probably. Right. right. Someday I'm going to tap that, right? Exactly. Maybe the mortgage is going to be paid off. You know, who knows? Yes. <clears throat> but but that income is going to flow back to me. It's just I'm not focusing on it today. I'm building the wealth. I'm letting the tenant pay down my mortgage or pay it off completely. Yeah. And then I'll have the cash flow. Yeah. How, how great is that too? You just said that like you buy a house that somebody else pays for for it for you. <laughs> and you the concept is amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like like this is stupid, but it's like yeah. if you if your goal is to have ten million dollars, what's the fastest way to get ten million dollars? To borrow it. <laughs> it's to borrow ten million dollars and then have somebody else pay it off for you. Yeah. 
That's what a rental is, right? Right, right. That's <laughs> income producing real estate. That's amazing. There's nothing else like it. I've studied like 75% of all wealth is held in real estate. You go downtown in any city, the names of buildings are financial institutions. They're life insurance companies. There's, there's a reason why more of our money is in real estate than anywhere else in our economy. That's fantastic, fantastic. Okay, so first tip you would say is don't quit your day job, which I love because so many people quit thinking this is the cash flow that's going to help them you not have a day job anymore because a lot of people preach that. Hey, get this cash flow to retire you today. Yeah, yeah, nothing wrong with that, but uh, it doesn't always work out that way. You know, then you have one vacant property and all of a sudden you're like, oh, right. crap, I'm short on money this month. Uh, so what's the second thing that you would say is something someone should consider? Well, be disciplined with your money. Okay. It's like we talked about these financial mistakes that the average person makes in every decade of their life. Yep. You've got to be disciplined. So uh, we've all made mistakes, right? Like I built a huge custom home and I was single and it was dumb. It was dumb for me, right? Mm -hmm. Like I, I literally live in a house half that size now and I'm happy doing it because I don't have to think about the payment. Right. Super affordable. We can travel and do things so it provides some freedom. Yes. And it looks great for me. Yes. Right? So I have flexibility to buy that rental or do something with a, maybe a development or hire another staff member because I want to ramp up and I'm not worried about my, my short-term cash. Right. Okay. Fantastic. Just out of curiosity, just so the listeners can hear and more for me too. Sure. Uh, that mistake that you called mistake, you, bought, you built a custom home. Did you sell it to correct the mistake or is it a rental? Would you no. Think? Yeah. We sold it. Um, it just was an area I didn't really know I wanted to be in and no offense. It was just like he was in Traverse Mountain. I just... I love the house, just didn't love the location. I was like, gosh, I'm driving to Salt Lake yeah. uh, seven, eight, ten times a week, right? right? Sometimes twice a day. Yeah. And I'd rather drive to Utah County like two or three times a week rather than right. worse. Right. So, cool. So it was great. It, you know, land was considerably more economical than it is, you know, where I live now, but. I'm, I like convenience, right? I don't yeah. like commute times. I don't like traffic. <laughs> so I just, I, don't know, I pay a little extra for some convenience. That's great. No, I love that. <coughs> okay, awesome. So then what would you say is the third uh, thing someone should consider? Self-education. Self oh, I love that. Uh, you know, I, I would say a lot of people graduate high school, right? Yeah. And more and more people are going to college and it's awesome, right? Yeah. Like I look back on my college education and I freaking love what I learned. Yeah. But it's not the end all be all. What does it really teach you? It teaches you how to learn. Yeah. It doesn't teach you if you're in computer programming, you went to college ten years ago, everything you learned is primarily obsolete, right? right. The text change. Yeah. But what you learned is how to read, how to get content out of it, how to apply it. Yeah. So if you can do that, you can do it in any any avenue. So for me personally, I focus two to three hundred hours a year in self-education where I'm going to a seminar, I'm going to a local RIA, things come and you can do it economically. You don't have to spend ten, fifteen thousand dollars on a week course, right? Right. There's a lot of self-development. If you're not growing, how do you expect your balance sheet to grow? Right, right. I love that. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's interesting because once people typically stop going to school, whether it's high school, whether it's college, <coughs> I've had a conversation with a handful of people, a uh, bunch of people, I should say, um, and it's amazing how many of them don't self-educate anymore. Once they finish school, they're you know they got a job and they don't need a, they don't just they just don't educate anymore themselves, right? They know what they're going to do tomorrow, not their nine to five. Maybe they're just turning on the TV and self-medicating. Right? <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's right. And I remember reading an article or a book. I can't remember. It was about, it was a long time ago. It was one of Donald Trump's real estate books that I was reading. Um, or, or articles uh, on Those are actually state. pretty good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> some, some of our listeners would probably mock us for yeah. listening to reading those Trump books. But, dude, he was phenomenal real estate. Yeah, yeah. And uh, one of the things that I learned that he did is he reads two hours every single morning to continue his education on real estate. <laughs> and yeah. I was like... I mean, this guy's at the top. He was at the top of his game. Probably still is at the top of his real estate game. But um, continually growing his knowledge in the world of real estate, which is really impressive. Dude, I have to interrupt you. There Please. was something. I man, I, I think I read this when I was going to Alaska like 12, 13 years ago. I bought. I didn't have anything to read. I bought a Trump book in the airport <laughs> uh -huh. that had a long layover, and I started reading it. 
like one of the most amazing things he did was he bought air rights of neighboring buildings so he could build one of the largest towers in New York. No way! It was the most revolutionary thing that had been done in New York. It was just <laughs> amazing how you can think outside of the box and really, really develop something that nobody else has done. Yeah, yeah. And you know, if we take the, that's fantastic. But and if we take the same concept with sports, think about it. Like Michael Jordan, Tiger Woods, these guys that were at the top of their game still had a coach, a mentor, a teacher, an educator. Right? They were still self-educating, <laughs> practicing. And, you know, arguably at the time they were playing, the best ever, and still trying to grow more. So I think self-education, I love, I love that, that was your third thing, is constantly be studying, constantly be studying. You know, question I get asked a lot, just out of curiosity, what your answer would be on this is, should I manage the property myself to save the property management fee and increase my cash flow? So I work with newer investors buying their first or second, and I get that question all the time. What are your thoughts on that? Well, Utah is the do-it-yourself state, right? That's right. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and I can I can understand, hey, you wanting to save a buck. And I would say, first seven or eight years of my career, I recommend everybody should self-manage. Learn how to do it. Join the Utah Apartment Association. You know, get educated. Get a, get a, uh, an evictions attorney on, on retainer, right? Like, yeah. Get the forms and, and go through and make the mistakes, because then you know how to repair your place, right? You yep. have the materials to put in. Yep. What what to paint or what not to do. Don't over improve it. All these different facets. And what I found is the learning curve is kind of steep. Yes. What I found is that I would say a lot of people are too nice, right? They take advantage of and and no offense to renters, but very slick. Mm -hmm. Like they they have problems managing money, right? And right. so that's typically why they are renters. And so when they have a problem, they're gonna go to you. And if you cave and you give them an extra month for free, I'll send their month back. And so being too nice really actually kicks you in the butt. So I would say hire a property manager, a pro, because there's things like fair housing, there's things like companion animals, and you could say no pets, it could actually hurt you. It right. could be actually uh, a legal situation that you're creating. Um, and so they're going to be more efficient than you're going to be. They're going to have software and ability for the tenant to pay. and. They're going to have staff members that can do the repairs, and they're going to have probably pre-negotiated prices for water heaters or maintenance calls or things like that. And so there's just things you can't do. And so if you want to do it and you want to spend the time, great, do it. But just understand, yeah. when we talk about op opportunity costs, <clears throat> you're saying yes to something else, which means you have to say no to another opportunity that may come. Right. And if you're not even educated, you don't even know what to seize, right? Right. And so you're just trying to do it yourself. You got this job. You got your kids. You're trying to manage a property. An opportunity that comes down the pipe, you can't even you can't even get up to the plate to swing because you're too busy doing something else. It's really, really a low dollar activity. Yep, I totally agree. Usually, I'll usually <laughs> one of the things that I'll share with people is hire a property manager first. Learn from them what they're doing. You know, go through several scenarios where you have to get an eviction, see how they handle it. Yeah, and then learn from their you know their actions and duplicate it if, if it's something you choose to eventually take over at one point you might hire the wrong property manager that's so true so just remember I've you, you kind of have to manage the manager yeah and i would rather do that right Absolutely. i'd rather look at a report have a call once a month for 10 minutes than spend 15 hours in a month yeah. doing something somebody else can do for 15, 20 dollars an hour. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, very cool. We're gonna jump to commercial, but definitely stay tuned because Justin has a nightmare story that he's gonna share with us. And you know, one of the things I love is learning from other people's mistakes versus my own. So nightmare stories typically are someone making a mistake and I love to hear the lesson and the listeners can also learn from someone else's mistake and the lesson to be learned. So stay tuned. With smartphones and technology making life a little easier, the SnapLeash has also been designed to make life a little easier for you and your pup. Whether you're out on a stroll in the park or possibly a walk through the city, or maybe even a hike up in the mountains, the SnapLeash is the perfect <coughs> leash for you. The SnapLeash can easily and conveniently convert into seven leashes, making the SnapLeash the most convenient leash in the world. What other leash do you know that is seven leashes in one? 
with Snapleash having appearances on the Today Show in New York City, TV 47 in Dallas, Texas, and ABC4 on Midday Utah, you are definitely going to want to take a peek at what the Snapleash can do for you and your best friend. Make life a little easier for you and your pup and visit www.snapleash.com today. All right, Justin, we are back. You guys are listening to K-Talk Radio, 1640 AM. This is the show, Utah, home sweet home. I am your host, Yoshi Shiraki. We've got Justin Puchar from Keller Williams in the house. He's going to be sharing a nightmare story with us. So, Justin, uh, I don't know anything about this story. Do you mind just diving into it? Yeah, hopefully uh, you don't cut me off. <laughs> the FCC. Um, so this is about, I want to say close to 10 years ago. I'd actually largely forgot about some of this nightmare until I started to relive it again last night. Oh, no. About it. <clears throat> so a friend of mine who's an agent had a foreclosure, right? Yep. Uh, was struggling to figure out what to do. I'd done a ton of short sales, foreclosure, prevention, things like that. This property was bad. There was atrocities in this property that would offend most people. <laughs> Walking through it, like the porch caps on the front and the back. He was in kind of like the Sugar Hood, South Salt Lake area. Got it. <clears throat> and um, open drug use in the property, right? Uh, like you could see it. Yeah. These porch pack caps were caved in. You had to be tentative where you were walking. Windows busted out, graffiti. I mean, you name it, it had happened in there, right? Electrical yeah. stripped. Uh, you walked into the garage and you could see more sky than you saw roof. Oh no! <laughs> so I mean, it was it was it was bad. So we negotiated a good price, right? And it took several months and along the time for us to try to get the bank to understand our position. We took like videos, right? We I actually created a website and had like over a hundred pictures so that they could see and understand the value that they were going to lose by if they took this asset back, right? Yeah. So uh, remember that we created this video, right? Right. <clears throat> we negotiated a great price um, over several several months, and then we said, or, or the the buyer said, "Hey, we're going to try to wholesale this." I'm like, "Great, no problem." So it didn't happen. And he okay. said, "Hey, we want to bring you back in because you've got the experience to try to project man manage this and make it happen." I'm like, "Great." So. Uh, I come in, we work with a contractor, we outline a budget, the scope, the schedule. I mean, it took a lot of time, right? Right. The day before he starts, you know, he's got his permits and everything, he quits. No way. I was like, oh, this is side number one. So my partner and I, were like, hey, we'll do it. We, you know, have experience in this. We'll kind of project manage it. The budget got out of whack. Like, uh, it was a crazy house, right? Yeah, yeah. We had to do some work ourselves, you know, fill in some holes for, for project contractors, uh, you know, we had hard money ticking, I mean, all these facets that go into a good good job, right? Right. So, we're about done with this house. Yeah. And do you know what an artesian well is? Uh, water that comes up from the ground? Yeah. Okay. Uh, have you ever had one, like, rupture? No. <laughs> yeah. So, in, in the garage, right on the property line, right on the footings, this artesian wall bus. Oh, no. And just spilling water. So we're pumping water out to the street, like 100 feet. Uh, we have to dig this up. There's also a big tree there, so tree roots. We're subterranean, like, like chainsawing water is spewing. It is a crazy experience, right? Right. Uh, we're like calling the water company. They're explaining. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was absolutely not. So and you turned off an artesian. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was it was a it was a high ground water year spring, and so it was really everything was just full. Of just oh my god! It was coming out of streets actually in South Salt Lake. So, anyways, uh, they finally got that capped and cemented and all that stuff. It was just unbelievable. So we get this house done. We put it on the market. We get a great offer. You know. Um, we go in our contract. Remember that video I said I made? Yeah. So in their due diligence, <clears throat> they Googled the property, right? And this is kind of newer YouTube, I would say. Oh, no. I had labeled my video the... The, the address uh, of the, the property. Address. <laughs> so they Googled it, found it, and they back out. Oh. Right? They see the atrocities. Yes. They can't, you know, how some people just can't see the finished product. They need to know the backstory, and the backstory is too much for them. Yeah. Images or video or oh, vivid. No. Anyways, that right there cost me 20 grand. Right? Oh, no. We ended up selling it $20,000 less. Um, and then about five days before closing, this 
somebody breaks into the property. You've probably uh, never had that happen. I have had that happen, yeah. <laughs> Copper thieves, right? Yep. They steal the line set, you know, from the furnace yep. all the way out to the condenser. Yep. You know, not a crazy expensive part. Or actually, you know, I don't know what it is, 500,000 bucks. But yeah. Then they take the Freon, right? The yeah. Line, there's no Freon. Right. They went up into the attic. They were cutting, this house had brand new electric, they're cutting oh. Romex out. Oh my gosh. So, <clears throat> I mean, it would have been, they couldn't have gotten $20 out of all this copper, right? Right. Like, it would have been better to post a $20 bill on the, yeah. on the window and say, <laughs> have a great day on me. Exactly. So, remember, this is five days before closing. Yeah. So, uh, I'm like, the hell with that. That's not going to happen again. I don't yeah. want them to come back and think there's more stuff here because there was right. really nice stuff in it. Yeah. So, uh, me and a friend alternated, and Sleeping I slept there. in the hall. Oh my gosh! On like a little air. Well, yeah, you could say that. And a baseball bat. I, mean, I was prepared, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Lights off, just kind of waiting. Uh -huh. I, I don't know if I was hoping or scared, but right. Well, so for for five or six days, we made sure that asset was protected uh -huh. until it sold. So. Uh, that's my kind of nasty experience. Wow. Were you single at the time still? Uh, I, man, that's a good question. It's probably right about the time maybe I was married. Yeah. Did you say, so, honey, I've got to go spend the night at this house. Yeah, she was like, what are you doing? Where are you going? I need to verify this. I'm like, come sleep with me. Let's yeah, sleep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> at the house, of course. Right, right, right. Exactly. Wow, that's insane. So... Did you get everything done in those five days to repair? Yeah, I mean, it was something that cost maybe like two grand to repair. It's just annoying, you know? Oh, super. You know, I mean, I've had a lot of theft opportunities uh, that, have, that I've got to participate in, not from, you know, from the victim side. Yeah. It's not fun, but it's just, I think it's just something you have to deal with. Yeah, 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 same here. So after, how did you find out that the reason they backed out was because they saw the video? Did they tell you, hey, yeah, right, they, they did. They did, okay. They did. So that's probably why I'm not very digitally conscious about, you know, sharing my wins because I'm just, you know, you just get kind of worried about that sort of stuff. So yeah. that's what I call my $20,000 lesson. Got it, got it. And, and you also learn how to check that little box that says private. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, that's right. And that video was originally to pre present to the bank, right? So they could just go back to the story a little bit. It was, and then, you know, like I did like, hey, a walkthrough video just to see the progress made yeah. after and before, and yeah, it, it burnt me. Got time. it, got it. So just so the listeners understand, back when there were tons of foreclosures and short sales, these banks you know, are out of Wall Street, New York City, or somewhere in, you know, California. They're not here in Utah. And so they have no idea of how bad this property condition is. And so they don't want to sell the asset for less than what the value of the neighborhood is selling for. So you have to share with them pictures and videos. Look, this property is way worse than what the neighborhood is. And that's why we're asking, that's why we're offering so little, because we need to spend all this money to fix it up. So that's why people are filming or taking pictures to present to the bank in case someone was wondering, like, why would Justin do that? But very common practice to, to well, negotiate well, yeah, with I the mean, bank. Yeah, they're, they're, they're sitting in a queue. <clears throat> They've got stacks of files. You've got to somehow get their attention. And, and if a property's really been, you know, beat up or there's a lot of functional obsolescence, if they take it back and they don't understand and then they just try to sell it on the market, they're going to take a bigger hit, right? they yeah. got to insure it. Maybe they got to keep utilities on, winterize it. All these facets that cost the money bank, cost your institution, which costs fees, right? Yeah. You go to originate mortgage or whatever else. So, you know, it is a service that we do provide. And in fact, foreclosures are kind of ticking up a little bit. Yeah, I agree. I've been tracking. Um, we actually just got one approved yesterday. Really? And it only took, took us like three or four weeks. Wow. Over Christmas. It was amazing. Holy cow. So, you know, it is, it is happening, but like that property has some damage, right? Yeah. Because I would say normally... If you bought a property in 2017 and you didn't make a payment on it for two years, the market's gone up enough, you probably still have equity you could sell it without shorting. You're getting the bank to approve a third-party approval of short. True. Very so, true. Good point. Good point. Excellent. Well, okay. So we're talking about building a rental portfolio. Um, we are going to dive in here today for another commercial break, but you're not going to want to step away because Justin's going to go over the step-by-step, step. like what's the very first thing 
you need to consider when purchasing your very first rental or maybe you have one and now you're looking to grow it into a portfolio. So stay tuned. We're going to cut to commercial and we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Yoshi Shiraki, the author of the book, My Body's Just For Me, the book written for children to educate children on the prevention of child abuse. With the assistance of multiple best-selling author Richard Paul Evans, we were able to publish this book as a tool to help break the ice in an easy and innocent way to help children understand and learn how to speak up and communicate. I have been invited numerous times onto Good Things Utah to discuss the importance of good communication with your child in regards to abuse and also to discuss how the book, My Body's Just For Me, is a great tool for every parent when having that tricky conversation with their children. For more information on the book, My Body's Just For Me, please visit www.protectourangels.com today. And remember, the more we focus on prevention, the less we have to focus on rehabilitation. All right, guys, we are back at 1640 AM K Talk Radio. This is the show, Utah Home Sweet Home. I'm your host, Yoshi Shiraki. Today we have Justin Puchar as our special guest. He is diving into how to build a rental portfolio. So, Justin, somebody's out there listening, they don't have a single rental, and they now want to consider <clears throat> developing some path to wealth so that they can retire com comfortably. Real estate for me has been that vehicle that I've been utilizing. Um, what would you say is the very first step that someone would need to consider? And, let's, and maybe we'll, I'll, I'll add to that after your first step, but what's the very first thing someone should be, the se second this show ends, they should go do? Oh, man, I wish there was just one. Because I feel like there's a lot of things you've got to do and you've got to consider. You've got to gather your assets. You've got you to dream a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. You've got to figure out what you want to do. Yep. And I think most people think that, hey, somebody else is being successful or, or Yoshi's killing it and he's making all this money. I want to do what he's doing, right? Right. And that's okay, right? You can live on that borrowed light for a time, but you've got to figure out if that's what you really love. You might get a couple of round properties and just not like it. Sure. Right? Yeah. And it, it may be because you're trying to self-manage that you don't like it. Right. Right? Right. And so I think you have to deep dive and figure out what you like. And so figure out what your constraints are. Gather your assets, talk to a loan officer, see what you're capable of buying financially. And then I would say, you know, the, the challenge with, I think, our local Utah economy or market is there's a ton of realtors out there, right? Mm -hmm. And because your license doesn't mean you've got the expertise that is going to make you successful in rentals, right? Or right. cash flow, right. or understanding a cap rate, or understanding what's an internal rate of return. How do I get a return on this money? And so, I would say sometimes it's not best to work with somebody that's in your family, right? Right. You've got a relationship with, and you feel obligated to use. Seek out an expert. Seek out somebody that can really that that's at a spot you want to be, and yeah. you want to model, right? Like, like I'm not going to follow somebody that's just got a Lamborghini that they rented because they think it's cool, right? Right. It's not attractive to me. Now, that might be attractive to other people, and there's nothing wrong with that, but I want to, I want that guy that's got a ton of assets, right, that he's done, you know, a ton of apartment buildings, or he's he owns, you know, 80 rentals, or whatever it may be, like, that. Yep. that's what I look up to. It's not the flashy, shiny object that revs up real fast. Awesome. Awesome. So, basically, I heard you say... Uh, uh, <clears throat> look at your assets. Uh, let's assume somebody out there just has an owner-occupied building. So from that asset, um, they have one house, they live in it. Right. They're going to talk, then I heard you say, discuss with the loan officer your capabilities of what you could purchase, right? And that individual will probably take yeah. into consideration your assets. Yeah. It's really, I guess, at that point, to see what you're qualified to buy, right? Is right, okay. right. So we, remember we talked about the, the, the most economical way for you to begin is use your own credit, right? Yeah. Use your own money. Yep. Yeah. So awesome. that's why you want to talk to a, a loan officer or somebody. Perfect. And and there are a lot of people out there, it's surprising, uh, had tons of conversations over the years of doing real estate where someone will say, well, I'll talk to a loan officer next year. I don't think I qualify this year. <coughs> Two years ago, three years ago, I had a foreclosure of bankruptcy, this right. or that, or I lost my job, or I had bad credit or this. It's incredible how quickly these things can be repaired if they get in touch with a good loan officer. Uh, and sometimes they qualify today. Right, and I've worked with several people that didn't think they'd qualify for another 12 months, but after putting them in touch with certain 
loan officers that I work with, they're like, actually, if you do this one thing, you qualify today. So if you're listening and you think, okay, that's great advice, I'll talk to a loan officer, but it's not time now, I would say do it tomorrow or do it Monday, right? Start and then and then you'll really know if, yeah, you are 12 months away. Well, and here's the other thing is you might say, well, yeah, maybe the end of 2020 is what I want to do. I would meet with somebody today because there's things that can pop up on your credit, a judgment, yeah. Uh, you know, loan programs are always changing, your credit's changing, there's fraud. Yep. So you want to figure that out sooner than later because it could be fixed in four or five months, right? Maybe. Absolutely. Right? Yep. But if you wait, you get a house under contract and then you go and talk to the lender and there's a blip, yep. you're kind of screwed. Absolutely. So be very methodical in what you're doing and really if you're working with experienced people, they're going to help you get there. And maybe I should share with you my very first experience. Um, back in 2003, I started looking at a house, right? Mm -hmm. So I hired an agent, and we'll just call him Alan. Okay. Alan was not very good at what he did, right? Like, he was very experienced, but he just didn't know. Like, he would send me properties, and I'm like, how do I know if this is a good deal? Right. And he just really couldn't provide an answer, right? He's right. That, he's that prototypical car salesman, that persona that you just don't, it just doesn't instill confidence in, in you getting <laughs> right. what you want. Right. So, uh, so, so you give me a list and there's two properties. One is $20,000 less than the other one in the same na neighborhood, right? Right. So I'm like, let's do that one. Yeah. That seems to make sense. Right. He was bank owned. He didn't tell me that there was a way to do due diligence. Uh, I couldn't turn on the utilities. I was really buying this house blind. Got it. It's crazy. Yeah. And you and I both know you should do all those different things. Right. You should check it out. Yeah. So we yeah. buy this property, uh, and I was literally ready to back out of it. My buddy slapped me on the back and he's like, like he said, this is how we're going to be successful as we take risks. And I'm like shaking in my boots, and I'm like, yeah, I guess you're right. Yeah. And we close it. And I still remember this day after we close, and I turn on the utilities, and I was like, Rain, yeah, it all turned on, right? Did, right, and the water wasn't leaking. And <clears throat> so the reason I share that example with you is, is, you know, he was referred to me by my friend that helped him buy five properties, and yeah. this agent didn't even own a property. Oh, and there's yeah. no knock to that, right? Right. But what I'm saying is, he isn't where I wanted to be. Right. He didn't provide the experience. He actually got me there by with some dumb luck, right? Right. Now. If somebody's ready to start, I'm probably going to say, do what is comfortable to you, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, if it's commercial, great. If it's apartments, great. If it's single family, we all identify with single family, I think, yeah. because we probably grew up in a house or a rental or something. Right. It's identifiable that there's a kitchen, right? Yeah. Like, I knew, I grew up uh, pretty on the low end of wealth, really poor, mm -hmm. so we had to do projects, right? Like, right. Reroof the house. Like we didn't have a pneumatic air nailer, right? We right. Did it by hand. Right. We had to finish the base. I'm cutting hand saw with like hand saw. Wow. You know, yes. We, we bought a you know a power saw. Crazy things like that. Like we built cabinets. Mm -hmm. So some of these skills really translate into real estate before I even knew because I had this construction background and I could understand how the houses works. How the how the rehab happens and how to fix something. Got it. And so start where you're comfortable. Um, just so happens for me, I kind of I kind of gravitate into turning shit into champagne. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Like there's a lot of beat up houses and there's perfect houses. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with a perfect house. It's just less opportunity for me. Right. Not that I want to be greedy, but I want the cash flow and the equity. Yeah. And I know how to force the appreciation. I know the repairs to do. Or I know how to get it done more economically so that I can actually turn it into the perfect house, yep. but I can actually participate in the equity appreciation. Yep, that's awesome. You know, and I loved how you say if you've got a goal and it's something that you might not tackle till the end of 2020, but you should address it today, it, it at least gives you a plan of what to start on for the next 12 months that may need to be completed. You know, um, I don't know if you follow Gary Vaynerchuk much, but oh, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Gary V. So I, I like watching a lot of Gary Vaynerchuk um, content and he had a caller who called in and she said, listen, my nine to five barely covers our living expenses and then I have 
all this other debt. So she says, I can pay our minimum payment on all our credit cards, pay my mortgage, pay my car, have some food to eat, but then there's no money left over to invest in. And Gary talks about you know investing in yourself and being an entrepreneur yeah. and all that stuff. And he, you know, talked to her, how much debt do you have? And I can't remember, it was like 50 grand in credit card debt. And she's like, how can I ever start a business when I've already 50 in the hole? And, you know, he put a plan together for her where he's like, okay, well, you just said that your current employment right now only covers the minimum payment of those credit cards. So he says, you know what? Get a second job. Get a second job and maybe work part-time, full-time, depending on how hungry you are to get rid of that, uh, that, that debt. But get a part-time, full-time second job, whether it's the 7-Eleven on the night shift or at the airport at the late nights or something, that second income will be completely dedicated to paying down your debt. And then once your debt's paid off, he says, keep that second job to build a little reserve. And then he actually said, go flip real estate. Yeah. And he says, use that second, that, that second job to, to fund the renovations. Right, save some money to fund the renovations, go get a mortgage, buy the house, then now you've got a little pool of money to fund the renovations, and now you can start to build some wealth, you know, going from 50 negative to 50 positive. People are too too anxious to just like quit their job, right? Yeah. They hate their job, but think about it, it's the end result. Like keep that day job, yeah, leverage it, right? Right. Use the income, utilize the second job, right? Yep. Use the side hustle to get where you ultimately want to be. But I'm telling you, most people I meet, they're just so anxious to quit their job. They don't even know if this is a passion of real estate. Right, right, right. And so, right. you know, like maybe you're going to be in this thing eight, ten years before you figure it out. Yeah, that's right. True. Like a two or three year, you know, foray into real estate doesn't mean you're there. Right, right, exactly. And like you said, you don't even know if you're going to like it. I mean, with real estate, I usually compare it to Baskin Robbins. There's 31 flavors of ice cream. And I love ice cream, but that doesn't yeah. mean I love all 31 flavors. Real estate's similar in that there's flipping, there's wholesaling, there's retail, there's commercial, there's office, there's self storage. I've, I've tasted probably not all 31 flavors, I, uh, but I tasted a lot of flavors. And out of all the flavors I tasted, my favorite flavor happens to be fixing and flipping. Although I realize rentals is where the wealth is built. I like cookie dough. <laughs> yeah, I'll make chocolate chip. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> it may take some, like you said, experimenting, playing around, tasting different flavors before you go, I love rentals. Or I understand rentals is what builds wealth and I don't love it, so I'll flip as well. Whatever it might be. Or... You know, you know, maybe you have a great job. Well, so. your interests are going to change too. Yeah. As an investor, and we see people. I mean, I, I'm here 17 years. I'm going to change, right? Sure. I've changed, and things get boring. You can just be buying single families, and I see this happen all the time. They get really bored. They're like, "This is just." Uh, yeah, yeah. I want to yeah. get into development. I want to do a 150 unit apartment building. Right. And those are risky, right? Right. But you got to think about what's the base hit. What's getting you where you want to be? Have a varied approach. Yeah. If it's boring in business, that usually means it's on autopilot. It's actually <laughs> producing good results. You've learned things. Yeah. It's good. It's good. It's good. Yeah, exactly. So it's not wrong to dabble in other things, but keep that main flow that's producing the asset or the cash flow with a monetary result for 10 or 20 years down the road. Keep that going. Yep. And there's a lot of listeners out there who may actually love what they do. They're in the nine to five of their passion, right? And and so just building a portfolio is just a great opportunity for them to have a retirement. They, they might not even want to retire anytime soon. Like my dad hates the thought of retiring. He loves what he does. Um, but he has rentals to the day he can't work anymore, uh, right. you know, because his health maybe prohibits or whatever. He's got rentals that can support his lifestyle. So yeah, absolutely. Okay, so what would you say now is the second thing? They've got in touch with a loan officer. They've got a plan. Maybe they're going to be pushed out three, four, five, six months, maybe even 12 months. But they've now got the ball rolling. They've started playing. What, what, what's the next thing? You've you got to build a team. So uh, you've got to find that agent or get on a wholesale list. You've got to figure out what you're going to do so you can recognize the opportunity. So you got to have somebody to feed you a deal, right? Yeah, and right. they got to walk you through it. You've got to get that person on your team. Sometimes it's an agent, right? Yeah. And that agent can really go to bat for you. They're going to see more opportunities. If they've done... 20, 30, couple hundred transactions, do, the, do you think they know yeah. how the mortgage payment works? Right. Do you think they know how to do due diligence? Do you think they know how to assess what that after repair value is if you put on a new roof or add that bedroom in the basement? Or don't. Right. 
right? Yep. So leverage experience. And so I would say don't be the black hole that you just go pick somebody's brain. That is like the worst thing ever. Yeah. yeah. But but give back. Say, hey, look, I'm going to help you build your business, but I want some time years. Like, I want, I'll go find you five deals, right? Yeah. I'll work my butt off. You train me, and then that sixth one's going to be mine. There's things like that that you can do to where you can create a ton of momentum. Yeah. I love that. So I had a mentor when I got into this business, and it was really funny because he had a, a kind of a medium-sized office, but he had his little crony group, right? And yeah. I would be in there just like hoping to pick up table scraps. Yeah. And every day they would go to lunch. I just didn't get invited because right. I wasn't in this group, right? Yeah. Well, I started working late, right? Yeah. And out of this office of 40 or 50, like at the end, it was just me and him at the office. Got and it. he would say, hey, what are you working on? Why don't you do it this way? Look yeah. at it that way. And I gained great perspective, and then all of a sudden, hey, he's going to launch. You want to go? I'm spending more and more time with my mentor, yeah. gleaning the habits. And I'm traveling with him. Uh, like, you got to give back, right? Absolutely. It just doesn't happen in one lunch meeting. It doesn't happen because you networked with him one time. Right. Like, go after it. Yeah, absolutely. That great, great point. When I relocated back to Salt Lake City about 11, 12 <coughs> years ago, I was doing real estate, living in New York City at the time, and moved back to Salt Lake, and I was like, okay, I've got to relearn a market now. What's the market here in Utah like? And I remember meeting an individual who has been uh, you know, a, a, a big mentor for me to this day, went into his office and sat down with him, and, and I met, I had just met him at the RIA, at the Salt Lake Real Estate Investment Association. And, it's a great uh, organization, by the way. Yeah, that's right. You're, you're vice president. Yeah, yeah. That's right. <laughs> you go there to learn, right? You, you go, go there to learn. network. Yep. You go there to self-education. Yep, yep. I was on the board for five years at the RIA. Salt Lake. Thank, thank you for your service. You betcha. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually the president who I'm talking about. Oh, um, yeah, he's <clears> awesome. Yeah, so... Went into his office and uh, we just got introduced by a gentleman by the name of Kip Roth. I met yeah, Kip Roth and Kip uh, introduced me to this gentleman by the name of Randall. And and um, first thing I said to Randall, I said, Randall, I would love to come work for you for free. Like just whatever you need, I want to work for you for free. And he's like, what's your goal? And I said, my goal is to learn the, the Utah market. And so I would love to be as helpful as I can to you for you know whatever you need me to do help with you, help with anything, basically anything. If you want me to go run and get you coffee, I'll go get you coffee. And uh, such a nice guy, he ended up saying, listen, you don't have to work for me for free. I'm happy to share what your goals are achieving and learning the market. And he took me under his wing for quite some time, uh, from time to time. You know, he's a super busy guy, but from time to time he would connect with me and uh, learned a ton that first year from him on the market. But Again, it was just constantly trying to provide uh, value to him. So what you're saying is because you were willing to help, he actually gave you more? Yes. Interesting concept. Yes, right? yes. <laughs> exactly. See I, see, I think everybody's had a hand up, right? Yeah. And I'm sure there's people that have come to you and said, dude, I need a hand up. I need some help. Yeah. And you're willing to do it because Randall did that for you. Right. Right? Exactly. And so I think once you've been successful, you're willing to pass that along to other people. It's just got to be in the right medium. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, perfect. So now you've built this team. Uh, you've got your finance. You've got your uh, property manager, your agent. Um, some people, you know, also may need to decide if, you know, they don't want to fix up. They're like, ah, I'm okay if my return is a little less. I know it's going to appreciate. I'm not worried about that. This is a 30-year play. I want something that I don't have to repair because I don't want the headache of building a contracting team. That might be you. It might be... It might not be you. You might be thinking, no, like Justin said earlier, he would rather purchase something that already has equity, cash flow, because uh, he can, of course, appreciate the property by knowing how to do those repairs. So that's something you're going to have to think of. But once you come to that decision, yeah, I want something that's a little rough around the edges or something that's ready to go, you've got this team. Now you've got to probably start taking into consideration management or hiring out management. So right. what would you say is the next steps for these people? Well, I would, I would say this. Yeah, you need the asset managed, right? You right. want it to be done, but that's really not part of my underwriting decision, do I buy or not buy, right? Right. It's just not. And right. that's going to take care of itself. Yeah. But I'm not going to buy or not buy a property based on the property manager. Yeah. Um, so 
you probably have to be good at numbers. You've got to figure out, like, I was at a luncheon yesterday for a Ria group, and I start asking this guy, he's like, yeah, I'm doing this apartment, so I've got this thing under contract. And I'm like, well, what are the rents? Or what is, you know, I asked him various things, he just didn't know. Yeah. He just didn't know, and I'm like, what, you've got this under contract with $170,000 earnest money, and you're, you don't know some basic underwriting questions? He just didn't know, he's depending yeah. on other people. Right. I gave him a few tips, right? And he's like, wow, I never thought about that. Yeah. And that's okay, we're always learning. Absolutely. And I forget where I'm going here, but uh, <laughs> I, I think you've got to get really good at numbers. And so the more deals you can see, then you can say, oh, that's a single, or that's a double, or that's a home run. Right. But if you've only looked at one or two, you just don't have the perspective. Sure, absolutely. Very cool. Okay, um, we're almost at the end of our show. Justin, I love touching on mindset a little bit for, from people who are you know <clears throat> super successful like yourself. And mindset for many of us, you know, we're not born with this like, you know, even even some of the best out there weren't born with the mindset of, of greatness. It, it was learned and developed. What are some of the secrets or, or tips that you could share for people out there that are like, yeah, this sounds great. I'd love to build a rental portfolio of five, six, seven houses that one day retires me, but I do this for a living, that'll never happen. I mean, how do they, they got to change that mindset, first of all. What, what are some tips? Well, I mean, what did Henry Ford say? Whether whether you believe it or not, you're, you're right in yeah. your way. Yep. Um, if you don't believe it, if you don't tell yourself you can do it, you absolutely will not. And so... I think it's a combination of things. You gotta get educated. You gotta get good mentors. You gotta read. You gotta turn off the TV. Um, you've gotta surround yourself with people that are greater income earners than you, right? Like yeah. you're the sum of the five people you hang out with the most. Yeah. Uh, you know, a good support system. Uh, there's no secret, right? Like, like uh, I heard this story once. There was a room of billionaires. Yep. Yeah. From varied across the world. And they, they, they were all trying to figure out what's a one commonality among them. The only thing they could figure out was that each and every one of them got up before 5 a.m. in the morning. Interesting. So for me, I look at it, um, if I can win the morning, I'm going to win the day. And that starts the night before, right? Like, yep. do I have to get a decent night's sleep? If I go to bed at midnight, am I going to get up at 5? I have the greatest intentions, but I'm just not going to do it. Right. You know, you got to do some fitness. you got to learn. You've got to really set yourself up for success. Right. And so uh, there's not going to be one size fits all for mindset, but you've got to push yourself. You've got, I mean, I'm going to go to a Tony Robbins training here. I've done a couple of them. Nice. That is fantastic for my mindset. Yeah. There's audio books. I mean, you've just got to push yourself. I love it. I love it. Guys, you have been listening to K Talk Radio, 1640 AM. This is the show, Utah Home Sweet Home. I'm your host, Yoshi Shiraki, and Justin Puchar, our special guest, has been sharing with us today how to build a rental portfolio. Guys, if you missed any of this show, you can check out our website at www.utahhomesweethome.com and click on our social media links. We post these videos on there. Justin, how can our listeners get in touch with you? Uh, you can call me directly at 801-842-3737. 801-842-3737. I'm in Sugar House. This is my office, Keller Williams, Salt Lake. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Justin, and I hope everybody has a spectacular day. 